Well, hello, everybody. Thank you so much for coming back with us this month, a whole month off. I know that was <laughs> sometimes you get out of the habit, but it's been good for me. I got a time away and got some medical things done. So thank you. Thank you for praying for me. I just enjoy so much of getting to go through these Bible books. I, I trust the Holy Spirit leads me into which book to do next. So I've come to First Timothy because I think there's so much confusion today about many of the truths that are found in this wonderful small letter to, um, I think, uh, an apostolic legate. He's not a pastor. He's not a bishop. He is kind of the next generation little a apostle, though he's not labeled that. So this is going to be an interesting study, a lot of theology, a lot of ethics, um, a lot of things we're just not sure about. So I will try to express those to you as best I know. I, I believe that the Holy Spirit not only inspired these writers, uh, but he inspired the collection and, and preservation of this writing for us. So it is very important that we realize that the, the doctrine of inspiration is a faith presupposition based on texts like 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3, verses 14 through 16. Uh, but it, it has to be the basis of the Christian faith because we really believe that God has spoken and that he has spoken clearly and he has spoken for us to understand. That's why I continue to emphasize that the key to Bible interpretation is the original author's historical context, not ours, and that he is the only inspired person in Bible study. And that one way we know that we have found something close to his intent is when we look at what could the original hearers have understood. And, and that is our protection on trying to take these things in wrong directions. But as you're going to see very, very quickly, godly, educated, prayerful men and women disagree over what these texts mean. And part of it is the ambiguity of the New Testament. And part of it is that we're so far removed from the original language and culture that things that seem uncertain to us were not uncertain at all to the original readers, but we have lost that ability to know that. Now, on this particular book, I have about uh, oh, five or six opening statements I want to make, and uh, I hope you got a set of the commentary notes. Vidal sends those out in, the, in uh, our email to you, and uh, so if you will look at your notes, I'm going to do those opening statements number A. Now, I believe, and I have entitled this uh, this Bible study, Paul's Fourth Missionary Journey. Charlie, I, yeah, <laughs> we got to go back and find the introductory notes, Charles. There they are. Now, if you look at number A, I want you to know that I've entitled this study, as you saw from the little ad, Paul's Fourth Missionary Journey. Well, that's a somewhat of a controversial idea. That means that the books that we're talking about for the tonight, the next few weeks, is a book that was written after Acts 28. So now Paul is in prison at the end of Acts, but we believe that the, the geographical movements, the cities he went to, are, do not fit into Acts at all. And since they don't, but there is a obviously a, a, a route and a map and cities that are listed in what we call the pastoral letters. I was noticing today, and my wife Peggy has an N, uh, NASB study Bible, there is just a wonderful map of supposed fourth journey of Paul uh, in the introduction to 1 Timothy in that NASB study Bible. If you have access to that, uh, it might give you a kind of a key of where he went. And uh, I think he went all the way to Spain, and there's going to be some historical evidence for that in some of these early church fathers. Now, tonight, I, as I was thinking through how to present this, you know, what I've done through the years, uh, when I deal with either Old Testament or New Testament subjects that occur over and over, it would take me forever to ex write those again every time or explain them again every Bible study. So that's why I put these uh, links to special topics. Many of them are just one paragraph, but many of them are several pages. So there are some places in here. I'm going to assume if you're interested, you'll take time to click on the link and go through the biblical information that I try to provide in much more detail for those who may be interested in a, in a certain topic or a certain theme or a, a certain uh, lexical item. So that's what these special topics are about. And I, I will be, be talking about those. Now, this looks to me like Paul was released from prison sometime maybe in the early 60s. 
um, and that he is going to do this this journey, this fourth journey. He's going to be rearrested and killed under Nero, and Nero was died in sixty eight. So it's got to be early 60s to somewhere around 68. And even in the pastoral epistles, two of the um, Roman legates that are mentioned by name only function at the end of Nero's reign. So I, I think we're pretty sure about the time frame for this book. Now, the purpose of this book, and this is another hair pull among uh, commentators. Most of my life and through my seminary days, I was told that First Timothy was primarily about establishing church administration, that it was about uh, organizing local churches in a particular way. Uh, but one of my favorite commentators, uh, Garden Fee, put out a commentary that I thought was so good, and he has convinced me that chapter 1, verse 8, which talks about false teachers, is a crucial key in understanding the pastorals. And just to be perfectly honest with you, one of the reasons that I wanted to do this book is because of the terrible hair pull in my own denomination over the place of women in leadership. And at the end of 1 Timothy 2 is probably the key text on that. I think in the days, days when we get into chapter 2 next week, and I've taken the whole Bible study time next week for just chapter 2, Vidal will send you an, an email of the Bible study that he and I did for the pastors in Mexico City on this very chapter. Um, I must admit to you, I still have just emotions about, um, we were in Mexico City, uh, there were several men, 70 plus, and women that were graduating from the Certificate of Biblical Studies that we offer free. And one of the older ladies, uh, um, 60 year plus, came up to me and said, all of my life I've served the church, but I've always felt nervous and inappropriate. And your Bible study on 1 Timothy 2 gave me a joy and a freedom. Well, that gave me a joy and a freedom. So I do have a perspective that I want to share with you next week. But th this is really is why I picked this book. So I think the background behind many of the things we're going to talk about, both in church administration um, and church leaders comes from the background of false teachers present in the Ephesian church. Now, the same problems are going to be found in Titus as Paul sends him to the island of Crete. So what we have here is not just a clean, neutral discussion of these theological topics. We have a discussion that is framed by the inappropriate behavior of false teachers and their surrogates in the local house churches. And I think women were being tricked and used by false teachers, uh, both in the Corinthian church, in the Ephesians church, and probably in the churches of Crete, which says it may have been a church-wide thing of the first century. So that's where I'm going to. Number C. Now, uh, the administrative, uh, the Old Testament does not give us administrative guidelines for local congregations. That was developed probably after Ezra and the great synagogue, but there's no guidelines in the Old Testament itself. But there is a manual of discipline in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And some of the administrative ideas that we're going to find in the pastoral letters are in some ways similar to the manual of discipline in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which tells me we're into a first century mentality on how to structure things. Now, my question has always been on some of this, and I'm just going to be perfectly honest. You can hear my mind. I want it to be thought provoking for you. I'm not trying to get you to agree with me. You know, years ago, we, everybody said, well, the way to do evangelism is to go to the to the big cities because that's the way Paul did it. He went to big cities, so we should go to big cities. Well, now, I'm not sure that Paul going to, to the larger cities and spending time there is the way that we should do evangelism in every culture and every age. It is true that Paul went to big cities and he gave the mandate for those local churches to reach out, evangelize and teach their whole areas. But is that a biblical principle that is solid for every church in every culture and every age? Well, I think not. We're going to talk about slaves in this book. Is slavery, because it's in the New Testament and never condemned in the New Testament, does that mean slavery is God's will for every culture and every age? And I would say no. Not, not really trying to push you here. In 1 Corinthians 7, it talks about celibacy, that we should not marry. 
Now, are you going to take that as a universal principle for every church and every culture and every age? Well, if you do, the church is going to be considerably smaller. No, no, no. There are some things that happen in the New Testament that have a cultural basis to them. And it's our job as New Testament interpreters to try to find the eternal truths that are wrapped in cultural husk. Now, just very quickly, the best way that I've ever seen that is in Garden Fee's book called uh, The Gospel and Spirit. And he makes this statement. I think it's true, though it's not a biblical statement. If the, if the scripture speaks with one voice, Old Testament new, on a subject, it's probably a universal principle. But if the scripture itself speaks with two voices, seemingly paradoxical, contradictory statements about a subject, it's probably cultural. I have found that to be helpful to me as a basic guideline on how to deal with some of these issues that seem to be relevant mostly for the first century and maybe not for every church and every culture through all the ages. We'll struggle with that some, but uh, I think this this is true here. Um, <clears throat> it looks to me like the reason behind these guidelines, so I'm kind of follow up what I just said. It's not just these guidelines are for God's will for every church and every society, but there were false teachers in these churches that mandated that certain things must be limited uh, in that culture. Um, <clears throat> when we get into this, you're going to feel uncomfortable, and I am too, but I'm going to share with you what I believe. I remember I was in a, doing an interim in a church where I, close by where I live, and I was doing Titus, I think, and I made a statement about something, and the public committee called me in and said, you can't say that. I said, it's right here in the Bible. They said, we, you just can't say that here. Now, <laughs> do you hear what we're doing? Now, wh where is the authority in scripture or in our traditions? We've got to be careful that traditions don't drive our understanding of text. We've got to look at text. We've got to look at the historical background of the author and of the recipients. And we've got to read the whole book and the parallel book. So I'm just kind of giving you a hermeneutical heads up before we get into this. Now, number D here, in some ways, Paul's, um, excuse me, it's number D. The similarity between these uh, pastoral letters, and here's where the hair pull, it's only been in the 19th and 20th century when scholars have, have said Paul couldn't have written this. The early church, and I'll show you in just a minute where, um, many, many uh, early church fathers, many, many ancient translations in, included these in Paul's writings, but the vocabulary is different. There's only, there's only about, uh, uh, there's a third of the words that are not found anywhere else in Paul's writing. Now, you wonder, what, what is the deal with that? Well, if you look closely, most of the vocabulary is very much like Luke Acts. I think it is a real possibility that Luke is the official Christian scribe uh, that wrote this down. Matter of fact, I'd even go a little one step further. I forgot what commentator said this. Uh, his, I have his name in my notes. Yeah, it's, it's uh, S.G. Wilson in Luke and the Pastoral Epistles. He makes the claim, and I think there's, there's evidence for this, that this was an attempt by Luke to write a third volume. He wrote his gospel about Jesus. He wrote Acts about the expansion of the church to Rome. And it looks like this may be the third volume the expansion of the gospel beyond Rome. So the vocabulary is Lucan. In many places, it's not Pauline. But again, I want to say there are some statements in here like sound teachings, worthy to be listened to, several characteristic phases that seem to introduce what I would call either hymns, creeds, catechismal truths, or liturgy of the early church. Now, if Paul is quoting from hymns, songs, creeds, and liturgy, of course the vocabulary won't be his. And finally, Paul is a, a very educated man. There is a totally different subject and circumstance here. Of course the vocabulary would change because of that. So for me, this is just, I just think it's Pauline, and I think we can defend it, even though some of the vocabulary and syntax is different. Uh, the last one I want to make is, why do we lump these books together? Well, it's their vocabulary is the same, has a Lucan tinge to it. There are false teachers in all three of them, not so much in 2 Timothy, because that's really Paul's swan song, but for sure, 1 Timothy and Titus. And they all do not fit in the chronology of Acts, so they seem to be post-Acts 28. 
Now, modern scholars say they're just made up. No, 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 you big weenies. I mean, some of this, okay, I'm over it now. Uh, let's go to author if we could. These letters claim to be by the Apostle Paul. Now, first of all, let me, as a scholar, I want to say to you, when we look at how first century people viewed authorship, there is a difference. Uh, pseudonymity was part of the Greek literature of the first century. So people did write in other people's names, but the people who read it knew it, it, that wasn't the person who was really writing. Now, see, in modern Western literalists, that bothers us really bad about the Bible. So I want to come back and say this to you, bottom line. I believe Paul wrote it, but if Paul didn't write it, I still believe the Holy Spirit was involved in collecting these writings and preserving them and providing them to us as a clear word from God. So authorship does not affect inspiration. Inspiration is a wider faith presupposition than simply this text or that text at the beginning of a, of a letter in the New Testament. I do believe Paul wrote it, and I do think he, he lists himself in 1 Timothy 1.1, 1, 1, 2 Timothy 1.1, 1, 1, and Titus 1.1. 1, 1. So that's tra traditional Greek letter writing thing. From whom, to whom, and a blessing, a prayer usually. So this is just typical letter writing of that day. Now, secondly, um, the reason, other reason besides vocabulary that modern scholars say, Paul probably didn't write this. They, they usually say something like it was written by a, a person in the Pauline group who knew his vocabulary but lived in the second century. Now, why would they say that? Well, number one, they say that the developed church organization is too early. <laughs> That's an assumption. They say that it, the developed Gnostic tendencies are too early. No, my friend, there was incipient Gnosticism, not only in the first century Mediterranean world, there is an incipient dualism in the Dead Sea Scrolls and in the ancient Near East long before this Greek philosophical system that we know from the second century called Gnosticism developed. So that one ain't going to work either. Now, thirdly, there's a developed theology. They would say these creedal statements which I have said to you is Paul quoting hymns or creeds or liturgy, is too advanced theology. Oh, my soul, it's too advanced theology for Paul, huh? Please help me. And finally, they say the vocabulary and style, which I, I think I've explained as Luke. So these differences, I, I've already said number C to you. I've already done that. Number D, there's a growing understanding of historical precedent. Now, what am I saying? As we understand more and more about the first century, thumbs gangs that we did not understand become more, more understandable to us. Let me go through this list real quick. The use of professional Christian scribes. Now, Paul mentions several. In Romans, he used a scribe. I think, I think Paul had bad eyesight from his encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus in, in Acts 9. I think that eyesight bothered him the rest of his life. I think his thorn in the flesh in 2 Corinthians 12 is his bad eyesight. So he could not write the tight little letters of a professional scribe. Now, he used to take the pen at the end and write, see what large letters I'm writing you to verify it was his letter. So I think there, there's scribes. And I think he usually used someone on the mission team. So one of the men that we know may have been that. And then the, also the other part is that the um, these hymnic quotes, there's, there is a lot of those. I'm going to show when I get to the text of first, chapter one where some of those are. I've listed, I guess, in the notes. You can see them. Thank goodness Charlie put them on the screen. Under number three, the A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. Those are all places where it looks like he's introducing uh, some of these uh, non-Paul lines that may be creeds. As a matter of fact, look quickly at D, H, three, D, three, H. Do you see those three little phrases? Faithful is the word, knowing this, that, and those things. Those, and look how often they're used. These look like these are literary markers for Paul about to quote something. Quote a hymn, quote a catechism item, uh, quote a creed, quote an early teaching of the church. Uh, it looks like that. And it, that's where some of this unique vocabulary is coming from. Um, let's see. Number E, just I don't want to hit this too hard because it, it, it just gives me, well, liberal scholarship just drives me nuts. But a number E is an attempt to show you if someone was writing in Paul's name, why do you think he would, number one, list people's specific names? Number two, events that are listed nowhere else in Paul's writings. And number three, mention the widow's role, which is 1 Timothy 5, 9, which we'll talk about. 
None of that's mentioned anywhere else. If you're writing in someone else's name, you wouldn't do that. You wouldn't use people. You wouldn't use events. And you wouldn't use uh, uh, offices in the church that appear nowhere else in that person's writing. No, no, that, that's just not going to fit. I ain't going to buy that. Now, as far as date, I think you, I, you see that I put the dates there for you. And there's some question. Would you scroll up a little bit, Charlie? You see that I've, I've taken this book, date, place of writing and relationship to Acts. This has been very helpful to me. And this is presuppositional, of course. Uh, this came from my um, doctrinal time at Trinity. It was, it was done by a prof, uh, the man there, uh, Murray Harris. He was a, a New Zealander a, a teacher there. I've modified it slightly, sl very slightly, but I've taken Bruce and Harris and tried to work out a place that I think is it fits Paul's writings, where he was, when he was, who he's writing to and where he's writing from in relation to Acts. So that may be helpful to you. It's, it's certainly not inspired, but it is an attempt to at least uh, share with you why I think these dates are something. Now, if you notice a number A where I said um, his post his post acts, post prison activities. I've listed several. The pastoral letters, if you look at 2 Timothy 4:10, I think that talks about things after. And then you look at Clement. Now, first Clement was writing in AD 90, first century, 95, I mean. And he mentions uh, Paul's travel to the far west of the Mediterranean world. Uh, that seems to fit with Paul wanting to go to Spain as he closes out Romans 15. He wrote Romans for the Roman church to know what he preached and to help him on his way to Spain as he passed through there. So I think there's another one. The introduction to the Muratorian fragment, which is, is a list of canonical books from Rome, somewhere between 180 and 200 AD, also meant introduction to the, the pastoral epistles, mentions that Paul traveled uh, to the West. And so we have it there. And then, of course, Eusebius, and he's writing uh, in the fourth century. He says that Paul was released from Roman imprisonment and, and went further. So I, I, I think all of those together make sense. Okay, let's look at recipients for a minute. That's another major topic here. Now, I wanted to say the name of the books. Why don't we call this the pastoral epistles or the pastoral letters? Uh, this first began, I think, with Thomas Aquinas talking about where he said the role of a pastor. He connected that to these three books. It then developed into German New Testament commentators, 19th century. Uh, I think, used it. And the first time it was officially used is in a commentary in 1703. And the name kind of stuck. Though Timothy is not a pastor, Titus is not a pastor, they're an apostolic legate or surrogate. And yet we, the book, the titles have just stuck with us. Um, number B, just real quickly. Uh, it's not written to churches. It's written to a person, right? Very few, only three of Paul's letters are written to people. But it's obvious it's written to a person to address churches. So all of these letters by Paul or whoever would be read in the local church, usually quick copies made of, and then passed on to another church. So what we have here is a, a letter written to a person meant to be read to a congregation so that Paul's going to give apostolic authority to Timothy for Timothy to do what is necessary in the church and there to listen to Timothy because he's an apostolic legate. And I think that's what we have here. So uh, I've mentioned um, it hints Paul's wider audience. How do I, why do I think what I just said? Number one, formal introductions mentioning his apostleship. He didn't have to tell Timothy he's an apostle. It's obvious he's speaking to a wider group. Number two, in these, it's a plural you. Now, it could be the editorial we kind of thing, but I think the plural you says it's for a wider audience. Uh, in chapter two, verse seven, Paul gives a defense of his call. Do you think Timothy hadn't heard Paul's personal story? No, no, I think it's bigger. Paul's writing to Timothy about things he would already have known from his time with Paul. Good example is 1 Timothy 3.15. So I just don't think that uh, it was written just to a person. I, I think it was a, a wider usage than that. Okay, let's go to occasion and purpose. Um, 
The main purpose would be to confront heresies. Now, see, that's, an, that's something relatively new in the history of commentators. Most of my life, I've been told these are church organization books, but I think Garden Fee has pretty much convinced me this is really about false teachers, and they, they appear over and over in 1 Timothy and Titus, and that, I think, is what the problem is. Now, people say, well, what kind are they? Well, here's the hair pull, and I'll, I'll show you a little bit more clear when I get in the, down a little bit further in my nose. It looks like they're a strange mixture of Jewish elements and later Gnostic elements. Now, how can a, the legalism of the Jews be related to the antinomianism of the Gnostics? Well, I'm not sure how it fits together, but it exactly fits the false teachers of Colossians. And, and of course, Colossians would, would also mimic the, the words in Ephesians. So I, I think we have a combination of early uh, strands of theology that are taking the gospel and twisting it. And that's what Paul is, is upset about. Really, Paul is not is, doesn't deal so much with doctrine. He does deal with it, but, but basically deals about Christian lifestyle. The way you know you're a false teacher is because of the way you live. And it's a Matthew 7 all over, by their fruits, you shall know them. It's not just what they say, it's their priorities and actions. And I think that's what this is talking about. It says sound teaching, not just doctrinal truths, but but lifestyle. Okay, let's see. Number C. Timothy was written. He's gonna he's gonna go to Macedonia, but he tells Timothy to stay at Ephesus, and he's to deal with the false teachers, and he's to help organize the churches. That's what he, house churches. That's what he's supposed to do. Um, it's very similar as what he does to Titus for the island of Crete. Um, Second Timothy finds Paul in prison with little hope of release. And so I think Second Timothy is the last book of these three, and it's right before Paul was killed. Okay, let's go to the false teachers now, that next item on your notes. Um, I want to read number A. I think it's important. It is difficult to discuss the false teachers because of our lack of specific first century information. Paul is writing to those who knew these false teachers firsthand. He, therefore, does not fully discuss their theology, but usually condemns their lifestyle and motives. That's what Jude does, too. So now it's, it's either you can see false teachers for sure by what they do. And you already know what they're preaching. That looks, that seems to be the deal. But Paul doesn't attack what they say about truths so much as he attacks the way they live, which shows they cannot be trusted. And I would say that's pretty, pretty true for church leaders today. Uh, don't tell me how to live. Show me how to live. I mean, it's, it's easy to say one thing. It's harder to live it uh, consistently through time. And that's where the test really, really is. Okay, number B, the main uh, interpretive issues that relate to is whether they were Jewish, Greek, a combination. Now, what I've tried to do here is false teachers seem to be a mixture of these two. Little A, Jews always incorporated some dualistic elements. That's a characteristic of Gnosticism and the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, Gnosticism, the second century, developed these common Near Eastern philosophical theological themes. Judaism of the diaspora. Now, the word diaspora just means the spread out. These mean Jews living outside of Palestine. They were much more eclectic, much more free to combine with other worldviews than we've ever thought about before as new knowledge of the ancient world is coming of some practices of Jewish congregations outside of Palestine. Um, and there is a first century precedent of Jewish Gnostic heresy in the book of Colossians. Now, some of the elements I've tried to do, number C, is to spell out exactly the Jewish elements and the Gnostic elements. So please look at your notes if you would. Here's the Jewish elements that talk about these false teachers. They're, they want to be teachers of the law, verse 7. They're of the circumcision party, Titus 1.10. False teachers warned about Jewish myths. Now, these Jewish myths, we'll talk about that in a minute. The teachers uh, concerned with food laws, 1 Timothy 4. Teachers concerned with genealogies. Now, we're assuming these genealogies have something to do with the genealogies of the Messiah that we find in Matthew and Luke, which you know are different, uh, or going back even further in the Old Testament about the, the line of David and the tribe of Judah. We're not exactly sure what these genealogies are all about. Um <clears throat> Let's see for a minute. Sorry, I'm <laughs> okay. 
Let's go to number two, which would be the Gnostic teachers. Why do I think there's a Greek element here? Well, this it's this asceticism that happened so early in the church from Greek philosophy, not from Old Testament teaching, for sure. Uh, it, it's going to forbid marriage. It's going to forbid certain foods. There's going to be sexual exploitation and an emphasis on I've got special knowledge. We usually tell the college kids, if someone tells you God only speaks to me and he wants your money and he wants your wife, run. I mean, those are the characteristic of these first century false teachers. I have unique knowledge. I have special knowledge. Uh, give me, I, I have a desire, better lifestyle. I, I have sexual pleasures. I have a freedom here that you don't. These are all characteristics of this. One, at least one half of the, there are two different kinds of Gnostics. One were very legalistic and one was very antinomian. So it depends on what group these people were a part of. Now, as far as a, a canonicity, I just want to mention to you that um, it's, if you know history here, very early in the church, first century, the four gospels were collected and circulated to the churches. Now, it's got to, you got to kind of ask, when was John written? At least the first three synoptics were recorded and, and, and uh, circulated earlier than that. And then you have what's called the apostle, which is the writings of Paul were circulated. And this was far before they were put into a, what we would call a canon or a group of books that the people believed are especially from God. So <laughs> the only list in all of these early um, early Greek manuscripts that we have, and the earliest ones are on papyri, the only one that does not have the pastoral epistles, is P46, which we call the Chester Beatty Papyri. But even here, the last few pages of the manuscript have been lost. So it, they may have been in the last few pages. We just don't know. But of all the Greek manuscripts we have, ooh, and we got a bunch, there is no manuscript that doesn't have the pastoral epistles except that one very early P46. Now, if you look in your notes, and I, you know, some of these names I can't pronounce either. These just aren't the regular Tom, Dick, and Harry names I'm used to. But I've listed them for you. If you're interested in seeing who these early church fathers were that even either quote the pastorials or allude to the pastorials, I've given all of those to you in the early church fathers. Number one, the list of canonical books where the, they occur. And notice the Muratorian fragment is there. The, the Cheltenham list, Athanasius Easter letter. Number E is the first the first ancient list of inspired books that exactly fits our New Testament today. It wasn't until 376, 367. Then the early versions that contain the pastoral letters, the old Latin and the old Syriac or the Peshitta. And then the early church councils that affirm the inspired status. And these early councils are going to be Nicaea, Hippo, and Carthage. Now, these are the earliest ones, and they're going to all assert that these are inspired and from Paul. Now, a process of consensus among early Christian uh, congregations of the Roman Empire, I think, set the canon. Now, uh, sometimes Roman Catholicism says they did with the church councils, but it is my Protestant belief that the dispersed geographical local churches accepted some and rejected other books. We know from Eusebius there were three categories of early Christian writings, accepted by all, disputed by some, rejected by all. Now, those three categories are how the early congregation spread out across the Mediterranean world struggle with what books are inspired. And there is no list just like our New Testament until 367. So you can tell the early church struggle with this, but I think it was local churches. Now, just to kind of go a little further with this, what was the basic criteria for accepting these books? There's so many books that claim to be written by so and so. And how did how did the early church know that the person wasn't there? How did they know? Well, here's how they did. What is the relationship of that person to an apostle? Luke got included because of the connection with Paul. Mark got included because of his connection with Peter. The message is consistent with apostolic writings. And the early church called this the rule of faith. You read this book by the apostles, everybody accepts as inspired. Then you read this other book. If this book doesn't fit, you don't let it in. So first Enoch doesn't get in. Shepherd of Hermas doesn't get in. There are several books the early church was familiar with that did not make the canon. The changed lives of those who encounter these writings. If this is from God, 
People who read it are going to get their lives changed. It's the presence of the spirit. And finally, a growing agreement of the list accepted by the early churches. So that's that's kind of where I'm coming from with that. Now, um, <clears throat> the need for a canon. I thought I'd go one more step with you here and see. It's number D, I think, Charlie. Yeah. You know, it's only the Christian faith that has a canon. Uh, Hinduism doesn't. None of the philosophy, it, uh, religions of the East don't. It's it's only Christianity that struggle. What books do we really believe are in, uniquely inspired by the one true God? Well, originally, the reason that this caused such trouble, the early church expected the Lord back tomorrow. That's why the Gospels weren't written down for decades. They said, no need to write him down. He'll be here by Sunday, <laughs> you know, or something. So the delayed second coming, that's the first one. The geographical distances between churches and apostles. And that day, you couldn't fly there. You couldn't drive there. They, this is a many, many day journey to these churches. So the geographical dispersion and far away from an official thought from an apostle. Then the death of the apostles. Everybody's dying, apostle wise. And then the early rise of false teachers. Judaism, Greek philosophy, the mixture of those two, and other Greek mystery religions like Mithra or uh, um, the mis other mystery religions. So you, all of this caused them to say, we need to know what's true and what's not. And this is where the church developed this rule of faith, uh, kind of a ruler to put up beside all these other books claiming to be from God and test them. So that's kind of where we are there. Okay, now I think that's that's introduction. Now, what Paul um, Vidal and I talked about is we'd like to break this up a little bit tonight and giving you a chance to ask questions at the end of the introduction before I get into chapter one. So this might be uh, fresh on your mind and you might want to either open your mic or write down a question uh, on the chat. And I'd be happy to deal with that for a few minutes on any question you might have about the, the introduction that I've mentioned. So, folks, the way that we typically do our uh, time together with Dr. Bob is that you're welcome to use the chat, uh, um, whatever you're connecting from, and also you're welcome to open the mic as well. So whatever is more convenient to you, and I know this is going fast and furious, and this is why we're putting the notes on the chat so you can um, you know, go back to them. The recommendation also has been that you guys register for the class. So via email, you receive a copy of everything that has been done tonight, mentioned tonight, the special topics, I mean, all of that information is given to you guys. And again, we put the link on the on the chat as well. So any questions or comments for Dr. Bob tonight up to this intro? All right, Dr. Bob, I think we're good. OK, let's get to chapter one then. If you don't have my notes, I hope you'll open your Bible. As you know, I try to do at the beginning of uh, each chapter, I try to compare different uh, translation theories from um, to try to show you the paragraphing. Now, paragraphing to me is the key to Bible study. There is no textual marker in Hebrew or Greek for paragraphing, but a paragraph, if you remember your English course, is a group of sentences around one subject. So that helps us say if these these verses are about one subject, I can't bring a lot of other subjects in there and be true to the text. So you ask yourself, if I'm going to preach on First Timothy one, how many points do I have? How many sermons should I give? Well, I've given you the latest Greek version that ha and, and in English, their paragraphing that's UBS four. And then I've done New King James. That's a that's a word for word. The New Revised Standard, that's a word for word. Today's English version, that's a dynamic equivalent. And then the New Jerusalem Bible, which is a French Catholic, very good translation, dynamic equivalent. The outline that I like the best for me is the New Jerusalem Bible. You notice he's going to do the introduction, who, from whom, to whom, and, and what about, That's and the address. Then notice we're going to do uh, the um, uh, suppression of the false teachers. That's going to be the main key in chapter one. That's why so many believe it's about false teaching, not about just church organization. And then finally, Paul's own calling. How did Paul get here? What did what? How, why is he unique? What did God do for him? And then finally, as you see, Timothy's responsibility. This is a pretty good guideline, I think, on how to look at this chapter. And I commend it to you as a way to do all chapters, try to find as a preacher or a teacher, how many main points do I have? 
and uh, what how many sub points so should i preach two sermons or three sermons out of chapter one well that depends on you but you can see how uh, these translation committees have seen the division of these subjects now here is where we get in when we go down to the verse chapter one verse one and brothers i don't know and sisters i don't know exactly what to do about this it would take me five hours to go through all the information i have on all of these these lexical items and people so what I've done, you notice I've, I have the thing on Paul there. Now, I have a special topic on Paul. I, I want to tell you who he was, how he got saved, what he did afterwards. There, there's a lot of stuff about Paul. So there's more on, on some of these texts than I have chance to do. First of all, I would talk about the name. It looks to me like that uh, Jews that lived outside of Palestine, and of course, Paul is, is not from Palestine. Uh, their parents gave them two names, one to function in Greek society and one to function in the synagogue. So Paul had two names, and I think it was Saul, Hebrew, and Paul, Greek. Uh, Paul is not, uh, it's, not an, a, an, it's not a word you I think you want to call your kids because it means a, a wobbler or uh, someone like that. Uh, it may have been because <laughs> the way we think Paul looked. Now, of course, you know that Bible doesn't tell physical description of Paul. So where am I getting this from? Well, I'm getting it from a second century book called Paul and Thelka from Thessalonica, which is obviously non-canonical. But Paul was there. And the book describes him physically. And it kind of fits some of the things we know about Acts or other Paul's letters. It, he was short. He was bow-legged. He was bald. He had bushy eyebrows and protruding eyes. Now, the, the first Corinthians said, you ugly boy. And they, they used a word that meant he stayed in too long, which means the babies are wrinkled. And that, so he, he wasn't an attractive man. The eye thing, I think, is back to the road to Damascus. I think it was his thorn in the flesh. So since this book described him that way, is it possible they took the Paul, name Paul because he was short? And maybe the nickname of the short guy, short one. Possible, possible. I really think that uh, it's the, the parents is a better option. The third option here, though, is he considered himself the least of the saints because he persecuted the church. Well, he certainly did. And he says that over and over. So could the word little be connected to his self-evaluation of him being the least of the saints? Those are the three traditional options. I think it was his parents. Now, the word apostle is another one of these huge words. I have a special topic called apostle, sin. Uh, this is a word that was used both in Greek literature and in the rabbis uh, for someone sent with a delegated authority, an official representative, an ambassador might be a good modern way of putting it. So this is the word that is used. It's one of several common words to send. But it takes on theological significance, particularly in John, where Jesus over and over says he was sent from the Father. And then in John, it says, as the Father sent me, so send I you. Oh, these are powerful theological terms. Well, Paul picks up on that usage and seems to use it in the, in the same way. So I think it's both a Johannine and Paul way of talking about someone with delegated authority. Now, one more point is, if you look at something like Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, it talks about apostles, prophets, da, da, da. Is apostleship an ongoing gift in the church? Yes, I think it is. But can I define it? No, I cannot. And the reason I think I make a distinction between a capital A apostle, the 12 that Jesus called plus Paul, who write scripture or their their surrogates and the little A apostles that we start seeing in Acts. And I've listed for them you in the notes, Barnabas, Andronicus, Junius, Apollos, James, the large brother, Silvanus, Timothy, Titus. And Epaphroditus. Now, these are all called apostles, but not in the capital A sense. The word seems to mean a, 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 a regional authority almost. Uh, we might, similar to modern bishop in some denominations. It was uh, an especially gifted person at organization, expanding the church, the, devising strategies for spreading the gospel. So that's, I think, the list in First uh, Ephesians 4.11 is a, is a, a list that continues today. I just don't know how to define apostles, prophets, and evangelists in ways that we put them into modern categories. I wish I could. It's in my notes. You can look and see. 
Um, let's go to of Jesus Christ. Now, there's this is a of Jesus Christ. I'm going to say Christ Jesus just in a, a little bit in the same same verse. Um, this is an abbreviation of a larger full term, the Lord Jesus Christ, that he is often called. Sometimes he's called the Lord. Sometimes he's called Jesus Christ. Sometimes Christ Jesus. Very rarely Jesus by himself. These names would have had tremendous significance for the first hearers. They would have brought uh, theological truths to the minds of those who heard them. So let's just take a minute. Now, again, there's special topics on this. It's listed in your notes. If you want more information and a, and a fuller list of verses, I, I hope you'll go there. So the first of all, we have this word Lord, which is not here, but it is the full title. Now, the word Lord is, is the Hebrew word Adon and the Greek word Kurios. They mean the same thing. Husband, owner, master, Lord. Now, in the Old Testament, uh, the, the Jewish people particularly would catch this. The Jews were afraid to pronounce the covenant name for God from the to be verb. Uh, we see it the I am and, and I am in Exodus 3. Now, we're not sure of the grammatical form of that, but we are sure it's the verb to be. So it, it's the ideal of the ever living, only living God. Well, they were afraid and because of that the commandment about do not take the Lord's name in vain. And this is this is the reasoning I think is so silly. If we don't say it, we can't take it in vain. So whenever we come to that name, uh, that that those four Hebrew letters, Y-H-W-H, we're not sure of the vowels. We think it's Yahweh. We're going to substitute Adon. Now, in your English Bible, whenever you have all caps, capital L, capital O, capital R and capital D, that shows you in the text is the Hebrew name Yahweh. Whenever it has capital L, little o, little r, little d, that is the Hebrew word Adon. So th is this referring to uh, the ideal of deity? It might surely be the ideal of deity. I, I think you can't get away that the New Testament doesn't claim that Jesus is divine. It, it certainly does. So what about the word Christ? Well, here again, it is a the, the Hebrew word behind this is anointed one. Now, there are three anointed leaders in the Old Testament, kings, priests, and probably, possibly prophets. So when John Calvin wanted to write a book about the life of Jesus, and he picked the that's, we get the same thing in the book of Hebrews, the three deals about Jesus. Uh, he picked these three ways to talk about who he is. He combines all three anointed offices in himself. So he is the anointed one, someone especially chosen, especially equipped for a divine task. Now, even the word Jesus has theological significance. It is a combination of the abbreviation of the name for Yahweh. There are no J's in Hebrew. It's Yeshua. Je there is no J. It's all, they're all wise. So it is the combination of the covenant name for God abbreviated and the noun for salvation, yeah, you can see it in Hosea. So remember in Acts, excuse me, uh, Matthew 1, 21, you shall call his name Yeshua because he will save his people from his, their sins. And that's about what Paul's going to say in the next phrase. So the next phrase may even be based on a creed or the meaning of the word Lord Jesus Christ. So I, I, hope, I hope that's interesting to you. Now, let's go, if we could, according to the commandment of God. Now, what Paul is asserting here is his authority to speak. He's going to say, I am an apostle and I'm giving my authority to Timothy for him to read this letter to you for you to obey him. And that, that's the thrust here. Now, notice, if you would, Paul's call, first of all, is called by the will of God. That's second Timothy one one. And then by the commandment of God, that's Titus one three. And then finally, Paul. I think it's referring to the, his call on the road to Damascus, Acts 9, Acts 22, Acts 26, where God spoke to him in ways that he, he had no option. So according to the commandment of God, God chose Paul, he's saying, to be the apostle to the Gentiles. Now, he's, when he says that, he's going to come down to God, our Savior. Man, what a wonderful title for God. Now, two things. 
this has Old Testament connotations. The place for me as a theologian that is so powerful to me is the parallels in the book of Titus that I've listed in your notes. It's going to call God Savior in chapter one and right after Jesus Savior. It's going to do that three times. It's obvious what that's doing. It's linking the persons of God the Father and God the Son as both being divine. Now, it seems to me there are several ways that New Testament authors do this. Number one, they use actions that only God can do to Jesus. A good example is the when they tore up the roof and let the paralyzed man down and Jesus said, your sins are forgiven. And the Pharisees grumbling that only God can do that. That's the whole point. <laughs> that, that is the point. And the other one is these titles, uh, Lord, uh, Savior, another way. The third way, as I see it, is the grammatical structure where either the direct object um, of a verb or of a preposition links both God the Father and God the Son together, which a Koine Greek speaker would pick up immediately as the parallel and equality of those two items. The other point I want to make here is that... Um, <clears throat> You know, there are several terms that Caesar claimed for himself, the Roman Caesar. Lord was one of them. Savior was one of them. And the early Christians died by the thousands because they could not make these political affirmations. They weren't really theological affirmations. They were political affirmations in that day. They were almost like a pledge of allegiance to Rome. But they uniquely called Jesus Lord, and they uniquely called Jesus Savior, and they died by the thousands under Nero and Domitian because of that. And that is this wonderful thing, God, our Savior. Now, for me as an evangelical, and I, I, am, I do have an evangelist heart, though I don't have the gift. It is so important to me that God is Savior. And I would say Savior of all men. There's, there's, no, uh, there's no select group here. He's Savior of both Jews and Gentiles. And I think this book is going to say, Paul's going to say, if God can save me. I was a renegade. I was a murderer. I persecuted the church. If God can have mercy on me, false teachers at Ephesus, false teachers at Crete, false teachers in Corinth, God can forgive you. God can bring you back. God can use you. I think Paul uses what God did to him as a wonderful light to those that he's going to say, Irenaeus and, and, and Alexander. There's hope, friend. You got to turn. You got to change. But there's hope. OK, now, chapter one, verse two, Timothy, my true child in the faith. Now, first of all, there's the question over true child. If you can see in my notes, there are several ways to look at this. It's usually traditionally been said that that means that Timothy was a convert of Paul, which I think he was. But because of the unique relationship within Judaism of the terms father and son used for professor and student wisdom literature, are uh, what we would say the rabbis. They had disciples and they would call the rabbi father and the children son. So this may be a way of saying Timothy was a special disciple that followed Paul, like the 12 were special disciples that followed Jesus. So it's either going to be a, a play on the word child, meaning convert, or child, meaning my my official disciple. And I'm not, I'm not really sure which one it is. So um, let me see here. Okay. That's that what I wanted to do there. Forgive me. My notes. <laughs> I rewrite a bunch of my notes when I do this for you. And sometimes they don't flow as easy as I want them to. Let's go to this uh, characteristic Pauline greeting of grace, mercy, and peace. Now, I, I typically in the notes, again, I don't think I need time to read all this. I've shown you that there is a variety and yet a similarity between all of Paul's greetings using the term at least grace and peace. You may be surprised that the word mercy uniquely occurs only in the pastorals. Isn't that something? And exactly why, I don't know. But it, as I look at this, I say, look, grace always comes first. The big deal is who God is, not who I am. And the big deal about the unchanging God is if we come to him and know him, it brings peace. There is no peace apart from knowing him. There is no peace with our fellow man without knowing him. So grace and peace seem to be the theological categories with grace being priority. Now, mercy is added here. Do you think since we've just kind of been talking about possibly the Acts 9 encounter where Paul was called the commandment to, to, to be his representative? 
there's where the mercy comes in. The kind of but this way, if God can save Paul, I don't care how big a jerk you are or how big a sinner, God can save you. I mean, what a wonderful truth we have here. Paul's conversion is not normative. How much free will did Paul have if you're not blind on the road and a voice out of heaven says, quit persecuting me? Paul did not have much choice. But I don't think that's the key here. The key here is God can have mercy on a man like Paul. Okay. Then we use the term father. Now, this is, we call it by two Greek words, an anthropomorphism. So anthropos is man and morphe is form. We're going to speak about God as if he was a man. We know he's not a man, but we only have worldly vocabulary. All of our vocabulary is time sensitive, past, present, future. All of our titles have a physical part. Now, God's an eternal spirit. He doesn't have a physical part. At least two thirds of the Trinity don't have a physical part. The only incarnation of the Trinity is Jesus. So God is a spirit uh, throughout the universe. So how do I characterize him? How do I let people know what he's like? Well, I pick family terms, intimate family terms. He is our father. He's a loving father. He'll discipline us, but he cares about us. And that, that's why I think we're using it. Now, if you notice, I've got several special topics there. Uh, the fatherhood of God, I, I try to take this subject in detail, and then anthropomorphic language used to describe God. And there are several of them, some physical items, some, some um, relational items. But if you're interested, I hope you'll look. Now let's go down to the next paragraph, if we could, three through seven. Um, I've written something new, and I'll go over it. It's not in your notes. Uh, this is going to be chapter 1, verses 3 through 11. Let me read this real quickly to kind of get it in the notes for you. First Timothy is primarily about how to handle different kinds of people in the local church. Now, think what I just said. First Timothy is how to handle different kinds of people. Let me delineate that. Number one, some are heretical false teachers, and they're mentioned over and over. Number two, how to develop local church leaders both men and women. You say, what do you mean women? Well, I want to tell you the widow's role of 1 Timothy 5, 9 is women over 60 whose husband is either gone or dead and the church is going to hire them to do ministry. You say, I don't like that. I don't think Timothy cares. Number three, how to deal with different, here's, look at this group here, age groups, widows, younger women, elders, slaves, and the rich. You can see that 1 Timothy is laid out to categories of different kind of people. So what Paul's going to say, Timothy, I want to give you wisdom, not only how to organize the church, but how leaders are to deal with these different groups within the church. And I, I think that makes quite a difference in how we look at these verses. Okay. Now, again, uh, I have the word Ephesus here in the notes. If you're interested about Ephesus and how that fit into Paul's ministry, there's an extensive note here. It's one of the largest. Jesus wrote this church a letter in, in uh, Revelation 2. Paul went to this church. Paul spent more time in Ephesus than he did in Corinth. He spent 18 months in Corinth. He spent 24 months in Ephesus. And that's why this church was so important. It's about to be torn up by false teachers. So when Paul got out of prison, man, he goes back to Ephesus again and tries to set things straight. And when he left, he left Timothy. You tell, you, you take up my job here. So if you want more information, please look at my notes on that. I think it'll be helpful. Okay. Now, the little, the little phrase in English, so that, you see that in your text. You see it's going to be verse 3 in your text. This little word, so that, this is a henna clause in Greek, which means a purpose clause. And uh, Paul uses this a lot. Or a lot. And uh, John uses it a lot. Um, I'm going to get to a note in just a minute where I'll, I'll mention how John uses this. But just to say here, Paul is going to say, this is what you ought to do and believe. May instruct, this is a military term for giving strict orders. This is not a suggestion, by the way, just like the Great Commission is not a suggestion. Uh, certain men do not teach strange doctrines. Now, <clears throat> you wonder, usually in Paul's letters, he does a thanksgiving to the church. But in two places, he does not give a thanksgiving. Galatians, because of the false teachers, and 1 Timothy, because of the false teachers. There's no... There's no uh, prayer for blessing here. He starts right out that about, here's the problem. And what are these guys characterized by? Well, I tried to list them for you there. Strange doctrines, attention to myths, 
attention to endless genealogies and mere speculation. Now, can we define all these? Absolutely not. But I do think there is some keys here. Now, first of all, I want to say this, and I hope you I hope you hear what I say. I mentioned earlier that surprisingly, the, the, the doctrinal elements of the false teachers, both in the pastorials, particularly 1 Timothy and Titus and Jude, is not mentioned. What is mentioned is the ethical um, problems, the um, the antinomianism of these people that becomes it, Matthew 7. I mean, it's the wolves and sheep's clothing. And how do you know? Because you examine the fruit. So Paul is going to deal with the with the practical side, we would call it. That doesn't mean they weren't given bad theology, too. Uh, Paul just knows they know what these te- people are saying. So he doesn't mention it. But he wants the church to say, if they don't live what the gospel says, they're not part of us. This is why the Antichrist false teachers in 1 John 2, 18 and 19 left, because they were identified by how they live. Uh, this is the people in Jude who were taking advantage, sexual advantage of the Lord's Supper, trying to prey on people. And this is one of the problems, I think, that's here behind the pastorials is the false teachers at Corinth. And I think here we're using young women to go from house to house, spreading their lies and false truths. So in these particular occasions, women's uh, liberty to speak and teach on behalf of some other teacher or pastor is limited. Now, you've got to decide if that's just me reacting or if there's something to that. Okay. Um, now, I mentioned again in my notes, some commentators try to relate these to Gnosticism. Well, they would fit Gnosticism of the second century is when we get the first writings. But look at the Jewish element here. This, these look like Jewish people. Number one, they're called teachers of the law. Chapter one, verses seven through 10. They have Jewish myths. That's in Titus 1.14 and 2 Timothy 4.4. 4. They have disputes about the law. Titus 3, 9. Those are the circumcision. That's certainly Jewish, Titus 1, 10. And possibly the origins of the Messiah from Titus 3, 9. So there is a definite Jewish item here. Now, exactly how that fits with all this other Greek philosophical tendencies, I don't think anybody knows. But we sure see these guys in Colossians. So it seems they're around. Uh, to teach no strange doctrine. Now, the word strange here is the word heteros. There, there are two words like this. There's alas and heteros. Alas means another of the same kind. Heteros means another of a different kind. And you would say, well, wh- what is it different from? Well, here again, I would say if they speak in ways different from the apostolic truth that you heard from Paul, they're false teachers. Now, that doesn't mean they're a false teacher. They disagree with me or my denomination, or my cultural (laughs) interpretations, if they disagree with with apostolic truth, those things that we believe are inspired by God, the New Testament, we could say, if this book doesn't fit that, if it contradicts or it adds to it, it it can't be what's for you. I heard someone say, I thought it was cute. If it's new, it's not for you which means we've got to go back to scripture. Strict scripture is priority for the thought and life of the believer, period. Five exclamation points. And you know who's false by the way they live, not just how they think, but how they live. Okay. Um, Now, verse eight, this is what I told you. uh, Garden Fee says this is the key verse for interpreting the book because it's so strong on these false tinctures. Now, the word myth, um, When I say the word myth, you have a definition that pops in your mind, and usually it's something that's not true. I think there's a wider definition in that, and um, I would like to recommend a book. And so if if you're really interested in this, it'll take you getting this book and reading a chapter, but I think it'll be a blessing to you to understand how sometimes the Bible uses myth, not as, as, as to its reality, but as to making a point that the hearers be familiar with. Uh, This happens in the Old Testament about the ancient Near Eastern myths about creation and the red dragon and stuff. They're mentioned in the Bible, but not not to their reality, but to the aspect about the conflict in in the spiritual realm or something. So the book that I'm talking about is a a book by G.B. Card called The Language and Imagery of the Bible. And it's chapter 12, 
which is the um, on on mythology, and it has four definitions. So, what here do you think the myths were? Well, the word myth you tend to want to think about the Gnostic speculation, but it you it's linked with genealogies, which means are we talking about what family the Messiah should come from, what country? We just don't know. But it sure looks Jewish here because notice it's got the Jewish law. We got circumcision and we got Jewish myths in Titus. So I, there's some way it's connected to Jewish misunderstanding of either text or the New Testament. Um, I was going to mention that Irenaeus and Tertullian, those are Latin fathers, of course, and they're early, but not real early. They believed it referred to Gnosticism because that's what they were fighting in their day. As you know, Gnosticism was the battle, big battle that the early church fought for the first 300 years. This is a, you might know the, the recent movie, The Da Vinci Code, which is based on the Gospel of, of Thomas, which is a, we don't have a Greek copy of that. We only have a Coptic copy and later copy, but it's this idea um, well, by the way, here again, if you're interested in Gnosticism, I got a link there that describes it as best as I know how and gives you the books that I think are really important. If you want to understand Gnosticism, it's going to take some reading and some time. Basically, it's a dualism between spirit and matter. Spirit is good. Matter is bad. So it denies the incarnation of Jesus. It says salvation is based on knowledge, not on the death of Christ. And then it says, since the body is is uh, doesn't count, it doesn't you don't matter how I live. So it's a real antinomian uh, theme in this. But some get real, real, real legalistic. So it's two different kinds of Gnostics the, the, you can see around the, on your screen there. There's the link on Gnosticism. When we get through, if you're interested, I hope you'll link on that. Now, mere speculation. This this is important to me because how much of the theology that I've been given is mere speculation. I've said to you, and I think it's fair, it's for me to ask any person who claims to speak for God, can you show me in the Bible where you got that? Then I have the right to read it, pray about it, and walk in the light that I have. But much of the theology uh, that, I'm, I, I, that I come in contact with, whether it be in linguistics or uh, lexical options, is mere human speculation. Friends, we want to base our eternal life on the revelatory truths of scripture and the God who never changes, not on the changing fallen speculations of humankind and how often we get divided by these fallen dogmatic speculations of people that are in our midst. And so Paul's saying, don't, don't start these fights in the local church over these kind of issues that are not clearly taught in apostolic truth. That's a good word for us. It's a really good word for us. Okay, rather than furthering the administration of God. Now, we've got a manuscript problem here. Um, uh, King James has a different word. It has the word edification. I've given a link in there for edify if you want to look at that. But I think it should be the household managers. Now, the uh, United Bible Society's fourth edition, that's the latest Greek text from the United Bible Societies, gives a to household managers. So what does household managers mean? It was believers' stewardship of the gospel message. It wasn't to build us up. It was to make us stewards of what we've heard. Now, this deal about stewardship, and that's what I wanted to bring my other note, if I can find it. Um, I think this deal about stewardship is used over and over about how, uh, here it is, how Paul uh, was considered to be a steward of gospel. And this is a new note, so it's not in your thing. So let me just kind of mention to it to you. Um, Paul is a steward and uh, by God, and he passes on and trust it to Timothy. And Timothy is to entrust it to faithful men. Now, do you hear? This is what we're talking about, passing on the stewardship of the gospel given to us. This is what we're trying to do through Sunday school. It's what we're trying to do through Bible studies. It's what we're trying to do. When Jesus said, go into all the world and make disciples, teaching them to observe all the things. Notice the practical part of that. That's what we're trying to pass on. And that's what this is talking about, which is by faith. Now, faith is the opposite of theories. Faith is the opposite of speculation. Faith is based on historical acts of God and the promises of those who are uniquely called to speak for him. So faith is the key here, not human speculation. 
Now, then it's in verse five, love, and it's going to list three things here. Now, love is crucial. Love goes back to the Old Testament. Just think of the Hebrew prayer that Jews open every service with called the Shema, which is the Hebrew word to hear so as to do. Uh, Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God. Now, there's the mandate to love. Jesus talks so much about love. Paul talks so much about love. 1 Corinthians 13. John talked so much about love. 1 John 4. Love is the basic characteristic of the believer and the basic characteristic of God. Now, notice here, he's going to describe this love in three ways. From a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from a sincere faith. Obviously, false teachers are in the background here. A pure heart. Now, Jesus mentioned that in Matthew 5, 8, right? The pure in heart will see God. What about a good conscience? Well, if you look at the next note, the word conscious is pretty much a uniquely Greek concept. There, there is no Hebrew word that matches up with conscience. The best we can do in Hebrew is the word breast, which talks about internal motives. What a conscience is, is basically the way someone looks at the five senses and brings order to their life in what is right or wrong, uh, how they sense appropriate action in their life and in their world and their circumstance. Now, unfortunately, Paul uses it several times when he was in trial in Acts before those different um, different kings and potentates. He said, I, I have a good conscience. I have that anything that is against what I believe God wanted me to do. He used the word twice in this in this chapter. Now, good conscience is when a Christian can say, I, I don't know of anything that I've done that's an open violation to God's law. Now, all of us sin and continue to sin. But the trick is you can have a good conscience and have a happy life. And this clean conscience is what the Old Testament could not do, the book of Hebrews says. And it's what the gospel does. We can approach God without fear. Why? Because of a good conscience. Now, the problem is the conscience can be warped by several things. Saying no, no, no to God over and over causes the conscience to be, Paul calls it seared. We would call it calloused. Uh, it cannot hear anymore, respond anymore. So the conscience can be damaged by bad information. So it's a biblical worldview. It's a knowledge of the scripture. And it's the indwelling Holy Spirit that helps us have a conscience that we can have peace with God. We, can, we don't have to have fear about him anymore because we know what Christ has done and that we have believed by repentance and faith initially and continually. And that's where this clear conscience comes from. So I hope you'll look at my note. I have an extensive note on that. I even think I have a special topic on conscience. <laughs> oh, yeah, another special topic. I've done a bunch of them. Now, sincere faith, this adjective is only used three times by Paul. It's used once, two in the pastorals here in Timothy, verse 5, 2 Timothy 1, 5, and for love in 2 Corinthians 6, 6, pure, sincere, different from the false teachers. Now, in verse 6 and 7, we characterize the false teachers again. And notice, and these are very Jewish categories. Uh, they strayed from the goal of ethical teachings. That's chapter one, verse five. They turned aside to what? Fruitless discussions, idle talk, meaningless talk, empty speculation. Look at verse three. They want to be teachers of the law. Man, that sounds Jewish, doesn't it? Uh, they do not understand the law. Now, there's no article there, but the context is obviously Jewish law. They make confident assertions about things they do not understand. <laughs> you ever heard those sermons? Um, number six, verses nine and 10 seem to reflect the 10 commandments. The tragedy of the false teachers is either, this is why I, I, I have a soft spot in my heart for false teachers because I remember when those disciples at the Lord's Supper, each of them said, Lord, is it me that's going to betray you? They, they weren't sure. It wasn't them. I, I don't want to be a false teacher. I, I studied the scriptures not to be a false teacher, but I'm going to be surprised when I get into heaven how bad I've misunderstood this. Now, I, I often pray before I preach, Lord, please, what's of you accentuate in the minds of these people and what's of me protect them from? And I don't know the difference anymore. So I, huh, the tragedy of false teachers, their spiritual blindness, which is often expressed by insincerity. Their willful rejection of light, not just ignorance. 
They lead others into error and ruin. Remember how Jesus said they, the Pharisees lead others into a ditch and they're both destroyed. Oh my, false teachers. Oh my. How do you know them? By their fruits, you shall know them. Are their fruits theological? Yes. If they deviate from apostolic teaching by their life? Yes. If, if uh, their fruit doesn't uh, add up to Galatians 5, 22, they're, they're false teachers. Verse 11, uh, 8 through 11. It's one long sentence. It's the purpose of the Mosaic law. There could be a lot of controversy here. Does the Mosaic law still have, have a power over the believer? Well, again, I want you to look here. I think um, I don't see the special topic I want to do. If, if, there's another special. I see Paul's view of Mosaic law. I'm, I'm going to mention that one. But another one that I think you ought to look at is the, the Mosaic law and the Christian now, what, what, how's the Mosaic law function in my life as a Christian? That's something we struggle with. There is a purposeful use of the Mosaic law that goes on through time. We can't be saved by the Mosaic law, but it does give guidelines for believers how to tr live with each other in society. So I would say that um, be very hard to, to separate in the Jewish mind the cultists of Israel from the ethical demands. But I think that Paul quotes the ethical demands as the, the bottom line that Christians ought to emulate. Now, what we want to be sure we get away from is that performance-based Old Testament and performance-based New Testament can't get you to God. The only way to God is Jesus. The only way to God is faith and repentance. You can't earn your way. So the Old Testament, the way we know these people are false teachers, they violate the Ten Commandments. But the Ten Commandments are not for believers in the New Covenant. They're for the unbeliever. That's why it says they're for sinners, not for the righteous. So these Old Testament laws don't function for the believer who's been freed from these rules, but are now under Christ rules. But they do show, as Galatians 3 clearly teaches, that the purpose of the Old Testament was to show us we're sinful and need Christ. So I think that's the, the purpose here. And again, these three special topics, the Ten Commandments, the Mosaic Law and the Christian, and Paul's view of the, of the Mosaic Law are crucial in understanding this. Now, the word if there in verse eight, notice where it says, we know the law is good. Well, now other parts where Paul says it's passed away. He says it's good in Romans 7, 12 and 16. But I want to remind you, Romans 7 ends, wretched man that I am, who can deliver me from this body of death? <laughs> well, the law can't, but thank God for Romans 8, right? Starts with no condemnation, ends with no separation. Holy moly, what a great chapter, Romans 8. So Romans 8 is for the believers. And Paul is struggling, I think, with some of his past in Romans 7. So the law is good. We're not, we're not faulting the law. The problem was not the law. The problem was fallen humans trying to keep the law. Now, the word if is a third class condition. It means potential action, but with some contingency. So the law must be used in an appropriate manner. And what is that appropriate manner? To, to a legalism for the believer? No, no, no. To show the sinner that they're a sinner and need to be forgiven by God. Look at verse nine. But for those who are lawless and rebellious, it's not for the righteous. It's to show wicked people, they need to be saved. Now, these list of words in verse nine, I think are really interesting. I tried to capsule the thought for you there. You can see in the notes, lawless means no recognized authority, their authority under themselves. Rebellious, they're not under any authority. Ungodly, they're knowledgeably irreligious. Unholy, opposite of godly, and profane, they trample the holy. Now, these people were in the church. So how were they doing this? By the way they lived. And Paul and Timothy says, look, and John, for sure, when you see that kind of action, those aren't brothers and sisters. Now, what are we to do? Well, we're, we're going to try to deal with them. We're going to try to help them to come back. We're going to turn them over to Satan, excommunication, so they may, re may recognize their sin, repent, and be rejoined to the family. Now, the list here beginning murders, immoral men, I think these are reflecting the, the Ten Commandments, the Decalogue. I think it's, it's kind of going back to that. I've given you a special topic on human sexuality. I think, uh, 
I think sex is God's idea, but it's been abused. It's been taken beyond God-given bounds. That's true not only in adultery and fornication, it's true in homosexuality. So that it's not sexuality that's the problem. It's men's abuse of God's guidelines for our own long-term joy, health, and safety that we violated. Now, when it says liars and perjurers, I think that's probably the Ten Commandments about false witnesses we're referring to here. And then when it says whatever else is contrary to sound teaching, some have said this refers to the, the, the Ten Commandments about coveting. Well, the other option is there are several places where Paul lists these kinds of sins, Romans 13, 9, Galatians 5, 21, that also ends in a very general statement. And this, of course, is that very is general statement. By the way, this the, the, when we get down to the word sound teaching, wow, we get the English word hygiene from this Greek word, which is a pretty good way to think. This is, this is teachings that make believers spiritually healthy, sound teaching. And the context, it's parallel to the glorious gospel. Wow. So now I've had a, a paragraph I want to read you right there. It starts with a difficulty. The difficult contemporary application of this text relates to modern believers being able to define false teachers. How does one differentiate between items of personal preference and culture versus crucial doctrinal issues? The answer must lie in the apostolic preaching of the gospel, especially as it relates to the person and work of Christ and how humans receive the benefit of Christ's work and live in light of the gospel's mandate to Christ's likeness. So it's not just doctrinal error, it's lifestyle error that seems to be the issue in the pastorals. Now, sound teaching is one of several words and phrases that lift up and describe God's truth. I've listed them for you. They're wonderful parallels. Look at this list. Word of God, word of our Lord, words of truth, words of faith, teaching, entrusted truth, the gospel, the faith, and scriptures. All of those talk about what we've just talked about which is sound teaching. <laughs> it, uh, it's wonderful. God, thank God we have scripture. Amen? Amen. Okay. Um, now, the word glorious gospel, I think this is probably synonymous with the Hebrew word kabod, which means something that was heavy, weighty, valuable. And then you add the brightness of the Shekinah cloud of glory. I think valuable and honorable would be a way for us to define this, the glorious gospel. And notice the bless God. Now, this is the word blessed. Usually, um, the word eulogy is only used to bless God, but there's another word in the, in the um, Beatitudes, Matthew 5, 8, uh, blessed are the, da, 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 da. this is that that word is only used here of God in the whole scripture. And it seems to be basically that Yahweh is worthy of praise, if I could put it, but it's unique use of that, uh, which I have been entrusted. Now, this is a key to me, and I've tried to list it for you in a new, I've added to my notes where I've given you where God trusts Paul, where Paul trusts Timothy, Paul trusts Titus, and they're to trust the next generation. So in the new notes, when you get that in a month or so, I hope you'll take a peek if you're still interested. Now that you notice the special topic, faith, believe, and trust, I hope, this is the word pistis that I try to show you all the different ways it's used. Uh, so if you're interested in the idea of trust or entrust or believe, that's going to be a very good special topic for you. Let's go down, if we could, to verse 12 now. I thank Jesus Christ, our Lord. There's the full title we saw earlier. This is the only place that I know of where Paul directs a prayer to Jesus. Usually, he directs a prayer to God the Father in Jesus' name through the power of the Spirit. But here, I think the context is going back to his encounter with Jesus on the Damascus Road, Acts 9. And in that context, that overwhelming encounter with Jesus to a false teacher like Paul, Paul is just oozing. Thank you, God, for having mercy on me. And of course, he's talking about Jesus Christ here. It could be God the Father. Uh, that's possible. So Paul believed that Jesus strengthened, enabled, empowered him considered him faithful and trustworthy, and put him into the ministry. So uh, this is this is, a, this is wonderful. The rest of the paragraph is devoted to Paul's amazement that God would love, forgive, and use a sinner like him. Now, <clears throat> this is a doxology, friends, and Paul, this happens all the time. It happens in the end of Ephesians 3. 
I call Paul's writing doxological writing because he'll he'll talk about who God is and what God has done. And he'll get so caught up. He'll just break into a praise to God, just break into a prayer of doxology. I just love Paul and his mind and heart retard. Thank you, God, for what you've done for me. And this is what he's saying here. He's so overwhelmed that God could love and accept a, a man like him. Now, blasphemer, verse 13, probably refers to pre-salvation, pre-Acts 9, Paul, that he 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 blasphemed the church and, and the, the teachings about Christ. Notice a persecutor and a violent aggressor. I've listed all the places where Paul talked about that. You can look them up if you're interested. And then he has shown me mercy. This is where I think Jesus just came to him in grace and said, Paul, why are you persecuting me? Um, because I acted ignorantly and unbelief. Now, I want to pursue this just for a minute. God said, Paul, I knew you were faithful. Now, see, this is this is against the ideal of Calvinism of total depravity, because like Cornelius, God saw something in Cornelius and he sent Peter before Cornelius met God in Christ. God saw something in Paul, even while he was a, not a believer and said, I can use that man. He, he loves what he believes. He loves scripture. And so it, this is the idea that there's, there's two. He knew I he knew I acted in unbelief in ignorance. I, there wasn't will for rejection on his part. There was ignorance. Now, I want to go back to the Old Testament again for this reason. There seems to be sacrifices for for sin. If it's unknown sin, sin of passion, sin of ignorance, sin of accident. But friends, there is no Old Testament sacrifice for known premeditated sin. King James calls it the sin of the high hand. Now, the special topic listed here, unintentional sins, basically delineates the places you can find what I just said. Boy, I thank God I live in the New Testament because my problem is not ignorance and unknown sin. My, My problem is willful disobedience. Thank God Jesus deals with that. Paul said he he forgave me and put me in a place of leadership because I, I was ignorant and gave the grace of our Lord Jesus. Now, Paul's theology about sa- salvation was the character of God, not the performance of mankind. Amen. Put Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 there. <laughs> Five disclaimers. It's by grace through faith, but it's by grace. Not of yourselves, not of works, not of man that anybody should boast. <laughs> it's not of us. It's all about him. And more abundantly, you see in my note there at verse 14, I told you this is a uh, super abundant. This is a who pair compound. Paul made up words. He just, we can't find them anywhere else in, in any kind of Greek literature. He just stuck compounds together to make things more and above where sin abounds. Grace does much more abound, that kind of thing. I've given you a special topic on the unique Hooper compounds used by Paul. They're really interesting. Paul was just an excited writer. He prayed a lot and he over, he really extends what who God is and what he's done. Which the faith and love which are found in Jesus Christ. And there we have the key things he talked about earlier. Uh, the sincere faith and love. And here it is again. Um, now the question is, are these gifts that uh, an, an individual comes to and has to respond by faith? You got to repent and believe to accept the gospel. Are these things that Jesus gives? Well, there are texts that say that Jesus gives repentance and faith. So this is that dualistic um, Eastern literature paradox. Must I repent or believe or does Jesus give me repentance and belief? And I got to we got to say the answer is yes. And so can we start out that mystery? Uh, Not the next 30 minutes. We can't know. Okay, I may have a little note here right above verse 15. The key here is notice God's provision for salvation comes only through Christ. There's just no other way, friends. He is the one, he is the door of the sheepfold. Now, I've listed some verses here. I hope you'll write these down and check them because in our day, the exclusivistic claims of Christianity rankle people. But friends, every monotheistic faith believes there is the only way. That's true of Judaism. It's true of Christianity. It's true of Islam. But you got to ask which one is true, which one is valid. Now, but here's the verses. John 14, 6. No one comes to the Father but by me. Acts 4.12, 1 Timothy 2.5, 1 John 5.10 through 12. They're not in your notes. I just added them today. Verse 15, it is a trustworthy statement. Now, here is another little textual clue 
that Paul may be quoting something or at least making a very important statement. This would be very similar to Jesus saying, uh, amen, amen. <laughs> he, this is a way to introduce an important literary claim. Now, many of us think the next two little phrases seem to be a capsule theological summary of the gospel. Jesus Christ came into the world that affirms his pre-existence. Uh, that would be against the Gnostic thinking on this part. And so maybe it's against Gnosticism. He is incarnated deity. He came into this world to save sinners. That's the purpose of his coming. His very name, Jesus, implies that. The combination of Yahweh and salvation. So Jesus came into the world. And what would he come for? To save sinners. And then Paul adds his own little footnote. I am the foremost. Man, do you hear it? Do you hear him? His self-worth is just, oh my, thank God what I used to be and what I am now. And every one of you would listen to me tonight feel that same way. God, what I used to be and what I am now. That's the good conscience that only the gospel can bring. An example, this may be the second reason. Not only was Paul ignorant, and that's why he was that God had mercy. Paul, God wanted an example of a really terrible, terrible person that grace can save and change. And isn't the persecutor Paul that kind of example? An example, I think, to these other false teachers who are worrying, does God love me, is even maybe an example to the angelic world. Do you remember uh, Ephesians 2, 7, Ephesians 3, 10, 1 Corinthians 4, 9, where that saved people are witnesses or evidences for the angelic world. This is Paul is an evidence to the human world of the extent of the grace and mercy of God to those who will respond to him. And Paul didn't have much of a choice either. For those who would believe in him. Now, I've, I've always, um, Chris, I, I think belief is crucial. There, there's really a really important uh, understanding of what faith, believe and trust means from their biblical roots. But the truth is that we believe in him and um, Jesus prays for us. John 17 mostly is a prayer for those who will never see him physically. He prays for his disciples at the first. Then he prays for those like us who've never seen him physically, but love him and trust him. Man, you ought to read John 17. It'll bless you. Now here, there are three prepositions that are used over and over uh, to talk about this. It's the word ice, the word epi, and the dative without the preposition. Now, for, for you to see this, this little topic, faith, believe, and trust, I've shown you in John how John uses those three prepositions um, and then just the dative. And if you're interested in John's use, boy, they're just powerful uses. I think it doesn't mean if we believe on, believe in, or believe upon. I think those are theologically uh, synonymous. There is no key there. I would say, if you see in the notes there, the gospel is a person to be welcomed, truths about that person to be believed, and a life like that person to live. Now, friends, I've just capsuled the theology and the practical side of the gospel. We welcome him. We learn about him. And then we live for him. And this is very much like Ezra 710. He he studied the Bible um, and then he practiced the Bible. So you know, look at Ezra 710. It's a pretty good model. Okay, eternal life. This is a recurring thing in John. This is the word Zoe, this, uh, and then the word a uh, word for forever, the word for age. Um it it's the future hope that's given to us. Uh, Paul's used the term for the new age, the kingdom of God, and the resurrected life. Oh, and I would say here, only God is immortal. I've come to the place I don't think that humans are eternal password, backward. Um, I'm still, I still believe that there is um, eternal life for those that come to God. I believe the reason that man in his sinful nature was taken out of the garden is lest he eat of the tree of life and remain in that terrible condition forever. No, no, we need to be changed. And eternal life is part of the gift of God for those who trust in him. This is the tension of the word eternal over the already and the not yet of the gospel. Uh, it's already here, but it hadn't been consummated. So I hope you'll take a, take, take a look at that. Now, the word immoral here, uh, and immortal means 
uncorruptible. Um, only God has life in himself. And then we have invisible. He is, he is spirit. He is God is spirit. He does not have a physical body, though he can manifest himself as the angel of the Lord or the commander of Joshua 6. But he usually that we think about it as a precarnate Christ and not God the Father himself. Um, the only God. Now, King James adds that we're the only wise God, but uh, that's the Textus Receptus. And the UBS gives that um it gives an A rating to the shorter reading. So I do think this is an emphasis on monotheism, which again could uh, be against Gnosticism, but uh, there's only one God. He is personal creator, redeemer. He gives promises of hope and restoration by means of the Messiah. Faith in Messiah repairs the breach of rebellious people, the gospel. Whoever believes in Messiah may have eternal life, the gospel. So I think that's... Um, as I look at this, I, I did a special topic called the characteristics of Israel's God, New Testament. And I believe I got it from this text. And these are the characteristics that basically the New Testament talks about that describes God. I think there's some in Colossians 2, very much like this. Be honor and glory. That's the meaning of the Old Testament word glory, kabod, that we talked about earlier. Forever and ever. That's literally unto the ages. It's, it's an idiom for eternity in Greek. And then verse 18, the command, here's that military command. There are two military terms here. He's going to command them. And then he tells Timothy, fight the good fight. Uh, it's hard to know sometime in Paul if he's using athletic metaphors, like of the um, Olympic kind of conflict kind of games, or if he's using military metaphors. Sometimes it may be he's trying to do both. Ephesians 6 is a good example, I think, of the military aspect. And fight the good fight is another one. Now, the word entrust, it's so powerful. It's this idea of trusting God. Paul entrusted the works of the gospel to Timothy. God gave him the truth. Paul passed it on to Timothy. He's going to pass it on to others. That's the second Timothy 2.2. 2. In accordance with the prophecies previously made, I think this is the laying on of hands of 1 Timothy 4.14. The early church was much more active in the gifts than we are, but the prophets in that church, uh, Lystra, probably, uh, when Timothy was saved and bought a part of the church, they recognized a giftedness there. Uh, that prophetic truth pronounced over Timothy gave him courage in the in the dark days and hard times he had to face. Uh, I, I, I've sure experienced that. Uh, some things that happened in my childhood that I didn't know about. My mother told me when I was older, oh, it gives me courage that God had a plan for me from the very beginning that I didn't know about until I surrendered to him. Uh, fight the good fight. Uh, I mentioned that. Keeping faith and a good conscience. And of course, we've talked about both those earlier. Uh, both of these are mentioned in, in verse five. Um, faith, the word faith, in the, if it has a definite article, it usually refers to Christian truths. If it's by itself, it can refer to accepting Christ by faith, or it can mean the Old Testament sense of faithful living. Now, in 1 Timothy, faithful living is a major category, so it may be used in that sense. Okay. I'm coming toward the end and give you a chance, brothers, to talk to me and sisters, uh, which some have become shipwrecked in regards to their faith. Now, the problem here is, what do, what do we mean by shipwrecked? And we don't know exactly what these two guys did. Um, we're not sure. Was it was it doctrinal? Was it practical? Was it both? Um, something they knew better and they did it anyway. And Paul says there's there's been enough harm that we're going to have to put them out of the church, put them back into the realm of the evil one, which is it's like the church is a protected colony and outside the church are dangers from de the demonic and, and fallen humans. And so. They put him back in the realm where he will recognize they sinned and hopefully, always, hopefully they'll come back. This discipline is always meant to be redemptive, not to be punishment. So and that's that's got to be true of even people like this. God, God can turn them as he as he turned Paul. He can turn them. So hand it over to Satan. It's not used very often, really. It's used of Job and Job 2, 6 for the testing of Job to for God to make his point about against the Satan. Um, it's use of, of Jesus being driven into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil, which is Matthew 4 and Mark, Luke 4. Wow. That was a, that was a 
time for that and the place for that at God's will. And then finally, the the man who was living with his um, previous stepmother in 1 Corinthians 5 is put out of the church because he's bringing condemnation on the whole church because of how he lives. So remember, notice the stated purpose in 1 Timothy 1.20 is to teach them not to blaspheme. <laughs> He want, they need to recognize what they're doing and then have the hope of coming back to the church. Okay, well, that kind of does, goes through my notes. And, uh, you know, I, I redo these when I, before I, I teach you these nights. And I hope you pray for me as I study during the week. Um, uh, next week is going to be a tough one and uh, we're not going to agree. And that's fine. I just, uh, it's like that lady in Mexico City said to me, we've never heard the other side. Well. I want, to, I want to give the other side, and you've got to decide where you come down, but we're still the people of God, and we're still the church. And I've always said to you, I want to be much more thought-provoking than I do definitive, and it'll certainly come true when we, as we go through these pastoral epistles. So, uh, Vidal, if you'll take control and do any questions or comments, I'll sit here and wait. Some of you might be um, coming tonight for the first time, and we're so glad that you guys are here. Some of you are returning uh, to our Thursday night. Uh, we are launching to First Timothy, so we want to say thank you. Now, before you guys disconnect tonight, before we finish our time, and you might have some questions for Dr. Bob, I want to make a couple of uh, suggestions and just go through some housekeeping issues. One of them is that if you notice on the chat, I place most, I try to do as many as possible, of the special topics that were described throughout the commentary. And I just gave you the links, but if you would like to get the actual PDF file, you need to register for the class. Um, I don't know if everybody has registered. I don't know how you got the, the link because Dr. Bob, what we did tonight also, we sent, and I said tonight, but I think it was yesterday, we sent a notification through our app and um, I'm fixing to put the, the the link on the on the chat for the app we would love for you guys to download bible lessons international app because everything that we do is posted through the app and you can download it on your phone your tablet computer whatever the case may be and um, that helps us a lot uh, just to get traction over our communication and uh, all that to say here's my point is that before you before you disconnect tonight I love for you guys to save your chat because that's where all the links are for tonight's teaching. And again, all of that will also come to you via email if you were to um, if you were to register. So I'm going to put both of the links right now on the chat, the registration for the class, and also so you can download the app and um, all of those resources are going to be ready and available to you. All right. So any questions or comments? Uh, love for you guys to open your mics if you have a comment or question over the passages. Uh, Dr. Bob, just quickly, next week, chapter two and chapter three or just two? Just two. Okay. So if you do some reading ahead, that will also help us a lot. If you can read some ahead and just come with chapter two, uh, go through it, just one sit and just go through chapter two. Questions or comments? Anybody? Somebody? I'm not looking at the chat, so I need to look at the chat to see if anybody put something on the chat. Uh, hello, I, I have a question. Yes, thank you, Christopher. Yes, um, the verse uh, where it speaks uh, about the law um, being good. Yes. Uh, I've lost where it is. Um, and the design, is it, how does he put it? Uh, I think it's verse 9. The, the law is not made for the righteous man, but for the lawless and rebellious. Right. <clears throat> right. Yeah. Could, do you think we can look at that as an insight um, into like why one of the reasons maybe that God gave us the Mosaic law and as, yeah. like sort of as I think it's in Galatians. I looked um, that it talks about how the law was uh, it was given to us as a tutor. To lead yeah, us chapter three. Right. Chapter three. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Is it like uh, an insight uh, for us, a way to look at why the law? Because a lot of times I'll look at the laws. So, well, why did God, you know, require that or what? You know, it's just a question. Some of some of the things in the Mosaic law that I wonder why God required of, of, of people, you know. A lot of it, I think, is that we've got to remember that 
you know, there's been some development of humankind and, and the ancient A&E was a pretty violent place. So the law was written for that day and, and those people who were without many of the blessings that we have today. And it was also written, I think, to keep Jews, Israelites then, from fellowshipping with Canaanites. So a lot of the laws that seem so funny to us really have to do with things Canaanites did that Jews can't do. But the ultimate purpose of the law, I think, is found, first of all, like you said, Galatians chapter three. And the book of Hebrews is so clear about the relationship of the old covenant to the new. And then in Acts 15, the Jerusalem council, where they said the Gentile, we couldn't keep the law. How can we put this on new Gentile converts? Now, there is a few things that are listed there that sound like Old Testament laws, but really those are fellowship issues that kept uh, Gentile, believing Gentiles and believing Jews to eat together in one church. So they're not going back to Mosaic law. But I do believe that this little to special topic I've mentioned, Paul's view of the Mosaic law, kind of, I give you all the verses. We have to say, Jesus said, Matthew 5, 17 through 19, the law is eternal, the law is holy, and anybody who changes any of it is least in the kingdom. But then he Right after that, Matthew 5, verse 21 through 48 says, you have heard, but I say unto you. So Jesus shows himself to be superior to the law in those next few, he even changes the law of Moses in one of those. So I think we have to say the law is fulfilled and uh, the limited national aspect of the Mosaic law has now transferred into the new covenant of the universal opportunity for all to come to Christ. Thank you so much, Christopher, for talking Thanks. to me. Thank you. Hoping that's helpful, brother. Thank you. Thank you for your question. That's very insightful and much needed. I just put uh, the link uh, that Dr. Bob just made reference to on uh, Paul's views of the Mosaic law. And um, love for you guys to look at it. And again, when you register these documents on PDF format, go into your uh, inbox and um, love to hear from you guys and see if you guys um, uh, need uh, any specific things in here. Okay. Um, anyone else? Dr. Bob? Yes. I noticed this question nine here at the end of this chapter. And what does it mean to hand someone in, over to Satan? Um, in Romans, we see where uh, we're told that they was uh allowed to to to, uh, to uh, be taken over by their own sinful desires. Do I see a distinction between that and in, in the Old Testament when God hardened the heart of the Pharaoh? Yeah. Well, for, I, I think there's really two really important questions there. And the first one is that this idea about turning over to Satan. The only examples we have are the first Corinthians 5, and these two accounts in the pastoral epistles. And it looks like we're talking about excommunication from the fellowship. Now, I'm not sure if it's a heaven or hell issue or an excommunication issue. It could be apostasy with eternal consequences, but it might not. And it all depends on if they repent or not. So the, they're putting out the fellowship is meant to be a redemptive act where they repent and return. Now, the idea about hardening Pharaoh's heart, again, there's another special topic to called, does God harden people's heart? It looks like he did. There, there's, it said seven times, and uh, four says God hardened Pharaoh's heart, and three times it says Pharaoh hardened his own heart in the same text. So it seems to me that God used the stubbornness of that Pharaoh to accomplish his will, but that that Pharaoh was still responsible for his acts. So I, I don't think that God turns us into puppets without free will, but the language of the Bible seems to say that if, if we don't look closer at the other textual options. In Romans there, where it says that, uh, that you can be handed over to, oh, to your own sinful desire. I think, that's, I think that's the same thing. I think that's parallel. Yeah. Oh, another way of oh. saying it. Yeah, sure do, Gary. Thank you. Dr. Bob, just as a follow-up question on Gary's comment, is that also related to the unforgivable sin? 
Well, there, you know, here again, there's two special topics I have. One is called the unpardonable sin and the sin unto death in First John. Now, as I look at those two, I think what that is, is a, the in the presence of great truth and light, people knowingly, purposefully turn away from that truth and light. And when they do that, there's no way back. So again, if you want all the verses, the special topic, the unpardonable sin, and the second one is the sin unto death make that statement. So it can only be committed in the presence of great light. The Pharisees are the teachers in the church. So it's not somebody does it by accident. I just wrote a little joke for a minute. Whenever it's a full moon, people call me late at night with strange questions. And I usually get that I've committed the unpardonable sin. And I usually say to them, listen, if you think you've committed the unpardonable sin, you haven't. Could you call me at 830? <laughs> because if you think you've done it, you haven't done it. So a lot of Christians worry about, I, I cussed or I said something about the spirit. No, no, no. There's a wider theological truth here. Please, please look at the special topic on the unpardonable sin where I compare two different gospels that change, that change the wording in such a way to make us think about it. Sometimes I wonder that if we create a division between being saved by grace and staying saved by grace, remaining saved, and I, I feel that sometimes that split creates the misunderstanding that we remain saved by our own doing, and that's where this type of questions come into place, which again, you constantly speak of the both end of the conversation. You know, that salvation experience by grace and the ability to choose and say yes to the gospel. Uh, but we're so driven by so much moralism today, moralistic, you know, deism. And uh, so this is extremely important. I put both of the um, links, Dr. Bob, on chat uh, for the topics that you just mentioned, um, the unpardonable sin and the sin unto death. Right. And they're, they're quite extensive. So there's a lot of reading to do. If you, guys <laughs> yeah. wanna, if you wanna deal with those in there, which, uh, yeah, it's, it's always helpful. All right. Anyone else? This is very helpful. Thank you guys for your questions. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Chris, Christopher. Anybody else tonight before we before we go? Dr. Bob, you want to give us a, a quick preview of what is coming uh, next week on Chapter 2? We're ready for to move forward. Well, I just uh, I hope you will read the text and pray for me and pray about yourself and <laughs> If you have a study Bible, please read the footnotes. If you have a brief commentary, pre please read that. You'll get so much more out of my presentation if you've prepared some, both in prayer and in study. <clears throat> then some of the things I say will make more sense. So I, I, I would leave it with that. It's going to be a difficult subject in some ways. It just, it's, a, it's a terrible fire in my own denomination right now. So that's what I wanted to do this and address it. I'd like to pray for us then and thank you all for coming. And let me close with prayer if I could. Dr. Bob, I'm sorry. Hold on yeah. a quick question. Chris Gonzalez has a question. Chris, sure. do you want to open your mic? Oh, hello, yes. Chris. Hi. Uh, hello, Dr. Bob. Uh, huge fan of yours. I followed your commentaries from on YouTube, and I use your material a lot for Bible study. Um, I was I caught the tail end of it. I was driving. Uh, we were driving home, but I, I wanted to hear. I think you said when it came to the women being used to talk and teach. It was referring to the Gnosticism that was going on. Is that correct? Is that the statement we're saying? No, that this this issue of women is going to be the hair pull of next week. Okay, so we okay. get this; it'll be online. But I don't want to wet my powder tonight on that. So, but I did mention okay. that the different groups that this talks about. Paul is told how to deal with men and how to deal with women. And uh, one of the women's groups, whether we're fighting over who is, is there a deaconess in chapter 311 or just the wives of a deacon? That's one issue. Mm -hmm. But the other one is going to be when we get to chapter 5, 9, where there is a group of older women who are hired by the church. So we've got women in places of uh, being hired servants of the church in Timothy. But what's happening today, the church is making some really dogmatic statements about what this or that means. So one reason I really wanted to touch mm -hmm. this particular book is at least to give my opinion on this and show you why I think that uh, I I affirm women leadership at all levels in the church. And I, I at least want to give my expression on that, though somebody who said I don't agree with that. Well, you're certainly a brother and sister and we can certainly still worship together. We, we may go to different churches, but we're still Christian. So 
my fear is it gets so ugly so quick, and that's what I want to avoid, but I want to bring some light to a controversy. Thank you.